I'm Neil Wood of the Kick Guru. The processor on this test bench is the Core i9 9980XE and it's running Time Spy, and that's the closest we're going to get to any gaming benchmarks with this CPU. A funny thing happened to me a few weeks ago. I received a phone call from Intel and they said, do you fancy reviewing the i9 9980XE? To which I said, yes, of course I do. Uh, when's it going to come? When's the launch? And they said, the launch happened an hour and a half ago. So I was busy Googling while uh, I was on this call thinking, well, that's unusual, no press release through. And there hasn't yet been a press release about this particular processor. Uh, and it was completely correct. The Americans have gone live with reviews, the UK, in fact, I think Europe, nothing whatsoever. Don't know what happened there, but you will have seen this type of box, that's a 7980XE box, but this sort of uh, engineering sample type box, you'll have seen various Americans waving those around three weeks ago and also Australians, uh, but Europe, nothing. We seem in the UK to have two of these processors on rotations. They come into reviewers for about a week, so it's obviously a little bit nip and tuck. Uh, and there still haven't been very many reviews in the UK. Nonetheless, Generally speaking, when you're doing a review, it's, uh, you know, the embargo is whatever it is, and you don't really know how everyone else is going to respond to the part. Uh, reviews go live, you're looking to see whether your review matches other people's, have you made any mistakes, and uh, do you come up with any conclusions they've missed? That's generally how it goes. In this case, I must confess, I've watched a few of the 1980XE reviews, uh, because I was waiting a few weeks for the part to arrive and I wanted to see what it was. Plus, and this is the fact of the matter, I wasn't expecting very much from this CPU. When we were in New York and we did the uh, briefing for Coffee Lake Refresh, not that Intel called it that, for the uh, Core i9 9900K, the 8-core 16-thread uh, part for the desktop, uh, they, they showed us the Skylake X feeds and speeds for the alleged 9th gen parts. And they uh, they were completely underwhelming. Um, uh, none of us, I think, knew that was coming, although probably video cards had showed the feeds and speeds that morning. But uh, before that, we didn't know it was coming. And it looked as though they'd simply taken the 7 series parts, crossed out the 7, written 9 in, soldered the heat spreader, that was it. It turns out there's slightly more to it than that, which is that the 7 series parts, 7,000 series parts, uh, the uh, feeds and speeds, the lower parts, uh, sort of 10 and 12 core territory, were low core count silicon, and the higher end parts were high core count silicon. Now with the 9,000, uh, but not 9th gen parts, they're all high core count. That means if you've got a 10 or 12 core part, you get more cash than you used to get. Up at the high end, the i9-7980XE and the i9-9980XE, they're the same blooming CPU. They just are. Uh, the subtle differences uh, come down to clock speeds, power, and heat. Uh, now, here's the thing. On paper, there's a significant difference, because on paper, this part, the 7000 series, uh, all-core boost 3.4 gigahertz, whereas the uh, 9980XE, 3.8 gigahertz. 400 megahertz, not to be sneezed at, out of the box, you know, stock thermals and all the rest of it. However, that's not quite the case, because that's non-AVX workloads. AVX workloads, uh, this part will go to 3.2 gigahertz, this part will go to 3.3 gigahertz. Basically the same. That soldered heat spreader appears to be worth about 100 megahertz. When I've overclocked these CPUs, there's nothing to choose between them. There just isn't. Out of the box, this part is better than this part, but the difference is subtle. Uh, if you overclock it, they're the same thing. While I was waiting for this processor to arrive, I watched videos by uh, Gamers Nexus, Linus, Hardware Unboxed, I think I saw Hardware Canucks, I read the Anantech review, and Paul did a day one, didn't he? Because he very had, had very little time, so he wasn't really doing a comparative review, he was just seeing how the processor went. And their facts and figures are correct. They just are. All those people. So if you're interested in this processor, I imagine you've already watched one of those reviews, and I'm saying the same thing. Should you upgrade from the 7980XE to the 9980XE, of course you shouldn't. 2,000, well, dollars, but 2,250 pounds is an insane amount to pay for a marginal uptick in performance. Absolutely marginal. Of course you shouldn't. On the other hand, if you do not have one of the uh, 7,000 parts, should you now go out and buy the 9,000 part? No, you shouldn't. Not, not a chance. And the reason is AMD. AMD has changed absolutely everything since the launch of this 18-core monster. Uh, now, when this came out, the uh, high-end part from the desktop, would you believe, from Intel, was the 7700K quad-core Kaby Lake. We hadn't even seen Coffee Lake at the time. 
AMD, on the other hand, had the 8-core Ryzen 7 1800X. They also had first-gen Threadripper. So we originally reviewed this part against a quad-core desktop Intel part. We also had the uh, previous high-end desktop parts, which went up to 10-core. And then we had uh, AMD at 8, 12, and 16-core. And the fact of the matter was, this 18-core part was a good performer. Crazy expensive, but AMD has since moved the goalposts almost out of sight. So we're going to have a, I think, a bit of a history lesson, very briefly. We're going to have a bit of a look to the future, and uh, I might shout a little bit. I tested my two Threadripper processors on the uh, X399 Aorus Extreme motherboard from Gigabyte, along with some Corsair LPX memory, because I needed stability. That's 3200 megahertz memory. This RTX 2080 graphics card, that Seasonic Prime Platinum 1300 watt power supply under there, and I used a uh, Fractal Design Celsius S24 liquid cooler, that's a 240mm uh, Acetec. For the Intel platform, basically uh, I stepped it up slightly. So the motherboard is an X299 Aorus Master, also from Gigabyte. Uh, I've used some G-Skill Trident Z or Trident Z RGB memory just for the looks of the thing. Uh, also 3200, so performance is the same. I used a custom loop system uh, for cooling, partly because uh, I'd read those uh, other reviews and they were talking about heat and such. Like I thought, yeah, I probably should step it up just to make sure that I'm not limiting the processor. The cooling system consists of uh, a CPU block from Aqua Computer, that's their uh, Cryos Next block, which is uh, specific to this CPU socket, LGA 2011-3. We've got fitting some EKWB. Uh, the radiator is now for cool 240mm, 30mm thick. Uh, it's copper, but it's the uh, new uh, nickel-plated model. A pair of EKWB VADA fans. The uh, pump is a D5, and the uh, reservoir and pump top uh, from Watercool is their Heat Killer 4 tube setup. And then the uh, coolant is EKWB Cryofuel Solid Laguna Yellow. And I've got a noise blocker fan blowing across the VRMs. That was installed both for Threadripper and also for the Intel setup because I wanted to make absolutely sure I was helping the systems as much as possible without going absolutely over the top in terms of active cooling. So whilst uh, I've put on a decent cooling system, I wouldn't say it's massively over the top. I mean, it's basically a really high quality 240mm all-in-one. The way I see it is that Intel invented the concept of the high-end desktop. Part is a sort of a vanity thing, and part is a showcase, and part is a way of selling CPUs for an awful lot of money to uh, desktop to, uh, users. So they would sell you a system that, or other a processor and motherboard that could be used for gaming, but would also do things like Blender or Adobe Premiere or some such. It would crash through video editing and they did a very good job of it. And then as the desktop part sort of crept up, you had to increase the number of cores in the high-end desktop part to uh, give you some differentiation. And then along came AMD with eight cores on the desktop and 12 and 16 cores for Threadripper, which is their equivalent to high-end desktop. And the gap, the margin, if you want, between uh, high-end desktop and uh, the upper-end parts in Xeon, uh, proper workstation and server parts, it got smaller and smaller. The problem was that Intel got carried away with pricing. High-end desktop parts, they were coming in at $999, which was £650 back in the day. And then when it came to the 10-core part, the 5000 series, they bumped the price up to $1499 or £1,000. And then when it came to the 18-core, suddenly that was $2,000, which became £2,000. Now we have the absurd situation with the currency in the UK that this $2,000 part is £2,250. We're paying more than the dollar price. So we've moved from a situation where you used to pay about £650 to paying over three times that. And that is just absolutely crazy crackers. And in return, you're getting less and less. This is the thing. Now, you have to ask yourself, why do you want a high-end desktop part? Uh, do you want to play games? Well, if you want to play games, why do you want 18 cores? The answer is you shouldn't. In fact, you can make the argument quite easily that the 6-core Coffeelec 8700 is a better gaming CPU than the uh, 
eight core 9900K. I mean, it's, you know, give and take and you have to assess the situation and hopefully games will come along that want more cores. So the argument in favor of eight core will move, but we've moved on now from quad core to six core, hopefully to eight core. We are nowhere near 18 cores, nowhere near it. But when it comes to things like video rendering, more cores is better. I'm talking x86 and the desktop because the fact is that the new iPad Pro from Apple with that A12X running on about 10 watts of power is a beast for video editing. Don't understand it, but it's a fact, it is. Nonetheless, in PC territory, you need an awful lot of power, you need multiple cores running at high clock speed with a decent graphics card and you've got a video editing workstation which isn't particularly great for gaming. Now I've got a 12 core Threadripper that I use first gen that I use, uh, which I use for gaming, general email duties, and also for editing videos. It does a decent all round job. When you bump up to the 32 core second gen Threadripper, you've got a thing that will pull this, these processors to pieces in the correct workload. If you want to do video editing and such like 32 core Threadripper, yeah, okay. But there are other things like Blender, where it just destroys them. It absolutely takes them to pieces. But that 32 core Threadripper is not much cop for gaming. It just isn't. To do memory access and such like, plus also games done not to make a 32 cores. And as it happens, the latest version of Ryzen Master with this thing about local memory access didn't seem to make a lot of difference for me. Uh, that's version 1.5, as I recall, rather than version 1.4. So, Intel has uh, made a rod for its own back with its ratchet on prices. Now, in the ideal world, they'd have looked at what AMD was doing and they'd have cut the price of this part here from, I don't know what, from $2,000 to ideally $1,000, actually. That'd be great. But then, of course, that would hurt their sales of Xeons. Workstation uh, buyers are going to go out and say, well, instead of buying that Xeon part, I'll buy this i9 part. Uh, you're into the territory of how much do you really want ECC memory? What will you pay for the privilege? It's that kind of territory. But they ain't going to do that because Intel doesn't cut prices. Intel pushes forward with the technology. Intel progresses. You have to remember, Intel and AMD both, they're 50 year old companies. They've been around a long time. And the way it works is they improve the technology. They improve the process. They change stuff. They make things better. You buy the next processor because it can do things the previous processor couldn't do. And Intel has hit a roadblock. The most obvious problem for Intel is the fabrication process. They've stalled. They've been stalled for a couple of years. We all know this. They've got problems that I don't actually quite understand because they haven't really explained them. Uh, I don't think I ever will explain them, but whatever the thing is, they can't get to their 10 nanometer process. Their 10 nanometer apparently is better than TSMC's seven nanometer, except you can't have the 10 nanometer. So it can be as good as you like, it just ain't available. So the process is a problem for Intel. The other really big problem for Intel is they're still using monolithic processors. They have a great big thing great big chunk of silicon, low core count, high core count, extreme core count silicon, and that gives them a limitation on how many CPU cores they can get. And off you go, the prices then go from uh, fairly high to really high to stratospheric. AMD, on the other hand, has moved to a modular design. The uh, Rome Epic processor has an IOX chip in the center and eight chiplets, which are the actual CPU cores. Each of those is uh, an eight core uh, chip and you can have eight of those, therefore up to 64 cores. The modular design they've moved towards using uh, Infinity Fabric as an interconnect uh, has moved them in a whole different direction to where Intel is at the moment. Uh, so on the high end, at uh, the server side of things, uh, it's, it's gonna yield enormous rewards for AMD, absolutely col uh, colossal. It would also seem that they're gonna do the same thing further down the stack, including Ryzen th uh, 3000, uh, which is Ryzen 2, Zen 2. But the Ryzen 3000 processors are also strongly rumored to be going down the same route. So you're gonna have an IOX chip and you'll have a couple of chiplets, which means they'll be able to move to 16 cores on socket AM4. All being well, that's the rumor. It also means that we can expect to see APUs at some point in 2019, which will be an IOX chip, one chiplet of eight cores, and a GPU chiplet. That will be truly remarkable to see. The modularity means that they can make these bits for considerably less than one monolithic chip. They have multi-purpose chips that can be a number of different things. They mix and match, they stick them together. 
uh, to use that uh, horrendous expression of intels, they glue them together, and they end up with a processor that does something that Intel simply cannot do at any price, and they do it for considerably less than Intel does for something that's vaguely similar. Hence, the 32-core Threadripper 29, uh, 2990WX, uh, in a workload such as Blender, will kick this 9980XE all around the park. Intel's response ought to be to cut the price of this processor to compete with Threadripper. Intel doesn't do that. Intel cannot move forward. They can't go beyond 18 cores. They could theoretically go to 28 cores. We're going to see at some point this uh, Xeon W model. That'll be interesting to see, but the problem there is going to be pricing. If this is two grand for an 18 core uh, high-end desktop part, how much is that repurposed Xeon with 28 cores and those motherboards with the insane number of VRMs, uh, you know, dual power supply and such like. It's going to be, I, I've said before, I think it's going to be £5,000 because how can it not be? Um, people are saying, no, 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 Intel wouldn't do that. It's like, pick a number, it doesn't really matter. It's got to be more than two grand, it's got to be a lot more than two grand, call it five, but why shouldn't it be ten? I mean, the numbers are just out of this world. AMD has moved its design in a different direction to Intel. It's had to do it. They've basically got a budget of £4.50, and they, they set out their stall a few years back. This is where they're going. Uh, Infinity Fabric is what it's all about. They're going to stick bits together, and the result so far is looking incredibly promising. I'm quite sure that AMD cannot believe their luck that Intel has been unable to progress from 14 nanometer. I mean, they've got plus, plus, plus. But nonetheless, the fact that Intel's been kind of stuck. So when they move from quad core to six core to eight core, the density of the, uh, of the cores and the heat has caused them real problems. The fact they've gone from tim to solder, I mean, that's a, a tiny detail. But the fact they've, you know, they should have done the soldering years ago. But they've made that change to kind of help themselves out. Clearly were the core to be smaller and a smaller fabrication process, 10 nanometer, and then moving on from there, you'd hope that would help them hugely. But nonetheless, they are where they are. In the meanwhile, in if Intel can get from eight core to this room of 10 core, possibly on the desktop, AMD is going to leap forward to 16 cores. Now, the rumor is they're going to announce this at CES. And as uh, AMD has its 50th birthday coming up next May, that's the month before Computex, they have to have big news coming. I mean, it's, it's a natural time for it, and they have the potential to just bring out a roadmap that's just going to be devastating to Intel. So AMD has changed how it's manufacturing processors. It's gone to TSMC and 7 nanometer. It's got clever ideas. It's got proper graphics in, the, in Vega, which it can combine with CPU cores in its APUs. And meanwhile, Intel has got this, which is a dinosaur. Intel has run out of model codes in the sense that the i9-9900K and the i9-9980XE, they are the end of the particular line, unless they move to 10,000, and I cannot see that. They've got to restart with their model codes. They've hit the buffers in terms of model codes. They've run out of ideas, quite frankly. Technically, they seem to have horrible, horrible problems. Now, this has been the case for a few years. AMD did what it was doing with its chiplet and its Infinity Fabric thing. It kicked that off five years ago or so. Intel must be aware of that. Intel clearly has a plan. They're not communicating that plan. They must have a plan. Whatever they are, they are not stupid. Also, Intel has a colossal amount of money. They are a very, 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 very successful company. AMD, by contrast, has had some horrible times for about the past 20 years. Uh, and yet they've still managed to do what they've done. AMD has a history of innovation. They integrated the memory controller in the processor, then did the PCI Express. They uh, did the X64 thing that Intel just said was impossible. No, no, you need Nitanium, they said. You can't just have X64 on the... No, you can't. And lo and behold, suddenly you can. Uh, AMD's gone to this... Uh, assembling chips together uh, technology, this uh, approach which is just going to pay the massive dividends. If uh, Epic in 2019 doesn't take significant chunks out of uh, uh, Xeon, I, am, I, I won't know where to look. I'll be just amazed. The single biggest question for me right now is not 
where's AMD going? It's how many chips can TSMC produce? Because that seems to be the single point of failure right now. AMD's roadmap looks amazing. The rumors are just, uh, wow, gobsmacking. Uh, it sounds as though AMD at CES is gonna have a remarkable uh, keynote. Uh, Lisa Sue is gonna have, just, she'll be laughing literally all the way to the bank and that'll build them up to May for their 50th birthday and then we'll have Computex. AMD 2019 is looking absolutely stellar. By contrast, Intel, it's absolutely horrendous. The 9980XE is a rebadged 7980XE with a slightly tickled voltage curve, 100 extra megahertz, and a soldered heat spreader. It is just outrageous how little you get for $2,000, 2,250 pounds, totally appalling. Were they to cut the price to 1,000 pounds, I would be eh, not that impressed actually. But nonetheless, it wouldn't be just like a bad smell under my nose. As things stand, this is, uh, this is jumping the shark. This is that thing in happy days when the Fonz on his water skis and his leather jacket went over that shark and everyone just thought, dear Lord, what have they done? They've, well, I mean, not the happy days was that great, but nonetheless, it was a thing. Uh, this is a bad, bad, bad thing. It has no reason to exist. No one should buy it. I can't think of a use case for it. It's been collected very shortly, and I shan't be sorry to see it go. Were Intel to give me this processor for free, yes, of course, I'd seriously consider building a workstation around it. Of course I would. I'd be crazy not to. I've got X209 boards behind me. I've got DDR4 memory. Why wouldn't I? Nonetheless, as it stands, it's going back, and I'm not the least bit sorry to see it go. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Hit the button, subscribe. We like subscribers at Kit Guru, uh, and a thumbs up is always nice as well. I'm Neil Ward for Kit Guru. This is the Core i9 9980 XE.